Having talked about what is meant by a fiduciary obligation or a fiduciary duty in the previous video, we can now begin to discuss what a fiduciary relationship is and in what circumstances there will be a fiduciary duty. And as I mentioned in the previous video, not all relationships will entail a fiduciary obligation. And there are some situations where there are established fiduciary relationships and there are some relationships where there are non-fiduciary relationships. And that's what we're going to be discussing in this video. So there are a number of well-established fiduciary duties. We've got the trustee and the beneficiary, we've got the director and the company, the solicitor and the client, the partner and the partner, and the agent and the principal. So the trustee beneficiary relationship is the leading fiduciary relationship. It has been adopted with modifications to other relationships, as we can see here, such as the solicitor and client and director and company and so on. So the trustee is bound not only to act on behalf of the beneficiary of the trust, but also required to subordinate his own interests to the interests of the beneficiary. In cases where there is conflict, the beneficiary's interest comes first. So in these particular cases, a fiduciary duty will be established almost always. However, there are also some additional fiduciary relationships outside of these particular areas. And we're going to look at a couple of examples now, but be aware that there may be other fiduciary relationships that exist between different parties that I haven't mentioned in this video. These are just the most common ones. So other examples of fiduciary relationships, we've got crown servants. So we've got this case of Reading and Attorney General. Um, and in this case, a sergeant in the medical corps participated in a smuggling operation wearing his uniform to help the smugglers get through army checkpoints. He was held to be in breach of his fiduciary duty, owed as a soldier in uniform to the crown, which allowed the crown to recover the payments made to him. So just to reiterate, we have a sergeant here in the medical corps stationed in Egypt after the war when Egypt was under British military control. And he was approached by some people engaged in some sort of smuggling operation. And these smugglers offered him a sum of money to sit in the front of his lorry wearing his uniform. And the idea was that if they approached a British military checkpoint, they would see inside the lorry that there was a British soldier driving and assume it was on official business and wave the truck through. He was caught and it was held he owed a fiduciary duty to the Crown. In other words, he owed a duty of trust and confidence to the Crown. And this was especially so because he was in uniform at the time. If someone in breach of a fiduciary duty makes a profit, as he did here through the accepting acceptance of money for the smuggling operation, then they are accountable to their principal for those profits profits. In other words, the applicant had been a sergeant in the army and he had misused the army property and his uniform to assist in the smuggling operation. And as the soldier owed a fiduciary duty to the crown, he was required to give up all of those unauthorised profits to his principal, the crown. Another case is Attorney General for Hong Kong and Reed from 1994. And in this case, the acting director of public prosecutions for Hong Kong had accepted bribes from criminals to drop cases against them. The bribes were used to buy property in New Zealand. The Privy Council found that there was a fiduciary relationship, which meant the property could be recovered. So just to reiterate, in this case, Mr. Reid was the acting uh, director of public prosecutions for Hong Kong. So he was in a fiduciary relationship with the Hong Kong government. He took bribes to obstruct um, prosecution of some criminals and used the money to buy some land in New Zealand. The Privy Council found that as there was a fiduciary relationship, the property could be recovered. In other words, this meant that the land bought by Mr. Reid was held on trust and had to be given over to the Hong Kong government. So this meant that property could be recovered from another jurisdiction. In this case, Hong Kong was recovering property from New Zealand. And this was held to be necessary to ensure that people in positions of trust could in no way profit from their wrongdoings. And as Lord Templeman said, 
As soon as the first respondent received a bribe in breach of the duties he owed to the government of Hong Kong, he became a debtor in equity to the crown for the amount of that bribe. And the final case regarding crown servants is Attorney General and Blake. So George Blake was a former member of the MI6 from 1944 to 1961. For his employment contract, he had signed an official declaration to disclose no information about his work. It applied after his employment ceased as well. In 1951, he became a Soviet agent, thus being a double agent. He was discovered in 1961 and the British government imprisoned him. He escaped in 1966 and fled to the Soviet Union. He wrote a book about it and his secret service work, and he, which was called No Other Choice. So Blake was here in breach of his fiduciary duty to the Crown. The court held that in exceptional cases, when the normal remedy is inadequate to compensate for breach of contract, the court can order the defendant to account for all profits. This was an exceptional case. Blake had harmed the public interest. Publication was a further breach of his undertaking of confidentiality. So if this was a basic contractual breach, then only contractual damages would be available. However, as this was a breach of his fiduciary duty, um, money from the sales could be sought as, um, as that, would, that would also be allowed where there's contractual damages. But they were also able to um, seek the projected sales of the book as well. In other words, they can make a calculation as to how many more books would be sold and get the damages for that too, which wouldn't have been available if this had just been a contractual breach. Another situation, another, another example where there is a fiduciary relationship is where there is a self-appointed agent. So in English and Dedham Vale properties, a developer unknown to the property's owners applied for and was granted planning permission, which greatly increased the property's value. He then bought the property at the original value. The court found that by applying for planning permission, the developer had appointed himself as an agent of the claimant. Hence, he was obliged to account for the profit made on the transaction. So let me just reiterate the case again. So a couple, Mr. and Mrs. English, were seeking a parcel of land and they were in negotiation with Dedham Vale Properties. Unbeknownst to the couple, Dedham Vale Properties applied for and was granted planning permission for the land. So the land was a lot more valuable as a result. However, Dedham Vale Properties did not tell Mr. and Mrs. English of this and bought the property at the original value, which was a lot less than what it was now worth with the planning permission. When the couple found out that they, um, when they found out about this, they were upset and they sued. The court found that when Dedham applied for planning per permission, they had appointed themselves as agents of the couple. And because an agent owes a fiduciary duty to the principal, in other words, a duty of trust and confidence, which includes a duty to disclose any conflicts of interest, he should have told them that he had got planning permission and was obliged to account for the profit he made on the transaction. Okay, and the second situation where we can look at a self-appointed agent comes from the case of O'Sullivan, O'Sullivan and Management Agency and Music. And in this case, we have a young singer, O'Sullivan, uh, who entered into an exclusive management deal with the promoter who induced him to sign a contract um, or contracts which were disadvantageous. In other words, he basically got stitched up by his manager. And the court held that there was a fiduciary relationship. There was a relationship of trust and confidence and the promoter should account for the profits he made. This is because he put his own interests as a promoter ahead of the person he owed a fiduciary duty, i.e. O'Sullivan. In this case, it appears that the fiduciary relationship arose because it was apparent that the singer reposed trust and confidence in the manager, not because the relationship of manager and artiste is one of a fiduciary nature. 
So the relationship of artist and manager is not one of a fiduciary nature automatically, like trustees and beneficiaries, but one that arises on the facts. As said before, it is always up to the court in examining the facts for a particular relationship to find there is a relationship of trust and confidence and therefore is a fiduciary relationship. And finally, for self-appointed agent, we have this case of Corbin Stoke. So we have a liquidator, and a liquidator is someone who bought into a com- who's bought into a company to dispose of or liquidate its assets. And liquidate just means turn it into money. So a liquidator has a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of the creditors of the liquidated company. So if this is a fiduciary duty, it means the liquidator has to put its own interest second. So a liquidator may come to a company and see an asset is a car and think it's quite nice and would like to buy it at a fair price, that would be conflicting conflicting his own interests with the interests of the company. So that's another situation where there is a fiduciary relationship. Now, on the flip side, there are some circumstances where the court has decided that there is not a fiduciary relationship or a non-fiduciary relationship. So we're going to look at one, maybe two examples of this now. The first one is employer and employee. It is usually held that there is no general fiduciary relationship between employee and employer. And that's from the University of Nottingham official case from 2000. However, the particular circumstances of a specific role may impose fiduciary duties, including the duty to act in the best interests of another. So a relationship between employer and employee is not fiduciary, At least there is no automatic general fiduciary relationship between them, as seen from the University of Nottingham case. However, if your particular job role imposes a relationship of trust and confidence, you will be in a fiduciary relationship with your employer. Directors may also be employees, and as we know, a director owes a fiduciary duty to the company. Senior employees may also be in a fiduciary relationship, as we see in the case of Tesco stores and Pook. So senior employees may also have a fiduciary duty to the company. And in this case, Mr. Pook had liability for acquiring land for the development of new stores. In breach of his fiduciary duty to Tesco, he took bribes and he made up some false invoices. And the court held that this was a breach of his fiduciary duty. The court said that Pook, as a senior employee, was effectively under the same duty as a director. And just to finish this video off, I want to have a little look at doctor and patient. And from the case of Sidaway, Lord Scarman said that the attempts fail. There is no comparison to be made between the relationships of doctor and patient with that of solicitor and client, trustee and SESDK trust or the other relationships treated in equity as of a, of a fiduciary character. Nevertheless, the relationship of doctor and patient is a very special one, the patient putting his health and his life in the doctor's hand. So in this case, the claimant tried to establish the doctor in question who had performed an operation owed that patient a fiduciary duty. And Lord Scarman said that this attempt fails. There is no comparison to be made between the relationship of doctor and patient with that of solicitor and client. So it is not a fiduciary duty. But this is still not entirely clear because there is some non-judicial suggestion that actually the doctor and patient relationship is a fiduciary relationship. So that's something to bear in mind if you get a problem question on this where you have doctors and patients and you want to know whether or not there's a relationship of trust and confidence, that may depend on the particular facts of the case and there is no real set in stone rule about it yet. Okay, so that wraps up this video. In the next video, I'm going to begin talking about specific duties and fiduciary duties and the duties that are owed when you're in a fiduciary relationship. But if you have any questions about this video, please leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.